catchy little tune right there. Welcome to North Point. Great to have you with us today. I want to welcome everybody here at our Springfield campus. You're looking good. Many of you even sounded good during worship and uh, sprinkled among you are some very creative singers and that's awesome too. Uh, I wanna welcome our campuses who are joining us um, as well as those joining us online. So if you're at the Republic campus right now, welcome, good to have you uh, over there. If you're at our Dream Center campus, uh, I hope you're having a great time. I hope breakfast is amazing today. Uh, I always like the updates. They have breakfast during service, which is a great idea. And uh, good to have you with us today. Um, I also want to welcome our Nixa campus. So Nixa had a big week this week. North Point had a big week this week. But specifically what's going on, Nixa, we had our groundbreaking service Wednesday night in Nixa. And that is awesome. Very exciting. Um, and it's happened so fast. It seems like it was only five years ago we started talking about this. Um, I know it's been a long process, and then we finally got the land, and then we finally got COVID, and then we and we finally this last this last uh, week broke ground. We anticipate a year from this fall to have our grand opening at Nixa, and we're thrilled. We're excited as an entire church that we would provide an opportunity to those on the south end of this uh, area to be able to experience Jesus is even more so, so we celebrate uh, with you as well. Um, so today, we're going to continue. We've been in this series. If you've been around uh, in this series, um, the last several weeks, we're parking in one chapter. Um, this is a dangerous question for a pastor to ask. Anybody remember what book we're probably talking about today? Ephesians. I heard Ephesians. Even if I didn't hear it, I'm going to go with it. I heard Ephesians. That's what we've been in this series. It's a letter that Paul wrote uh, to people who lived in Ephesus. And so we're going to be looking at that uh, today. Uh, as we do that, I want to I want to talk today. We have an opportunity. If you ever wondered, do we get to talk about tension uh, related stuff around here? Absolutely, we do. And I'm thrilled. Um, so we're going to start with a warm up tension, and we'll, we'll, we'll probably we'll probably keep going. But um, one is, at the risk of dividing everybody that calls North Point home, are you a Marvel or a DC comic person? Because there's only one of two. How many of you are DC? You're DC, I'm DC. Anybody DC? Really? Like, what's up with Springfield? Like, okay, I'm assuming it's a lot more split than the other. How many of you are Marvel? Okay. I just feel like, like I could put away my notes. Let's just talk today, okay? A, I just feel like the character development's very good in DC. But um, uh, so, and, and I'm not a math major, but that wasn't 100% participation. I don't know how that is with the campuses, but like, it's not like there's a third option, like VeggieTales. Like, I don't know, what's the third option on, okay, so here's the deal. On the count of three, whatever your favorite superhero uh, is of all time, uh, I want you to give it to on the count of three. Um, one, two, three. Okay, that was not the count of three. Okay, but, um, okay, so think of all these superheroes, right? Typically, a superhero has a super weapon. Um, you think of Thor, and his weapon is? The hammer. You think of the Incredible Hulk, his weapon is? Anger. Um, you think of, you think of Spider-Man, his weapon is? Webs. You think of um, Captain America, his weapon is? The shield. You think of Tony Stark, his weapon is? Money. Okay, so, so everybody's right, got their weapon. I want to talk today about, um, it's not really a weapon, but Captain America's weapon is the shield. We're going to talk about the shield of faith. We've been in this series looking at the armor of God. These are things that Paul writes to us probably from his observational science as he's in a prison cell being guarded by a Roman soldier. He's writing down uh, items from a Roman soldier's garb and giving spiritual applications to, well, it wasn't written to us, but it's definitely something that we we can get from it, but it was written to the Christians, the early followers of Jesus in this port city of Ephesus who lived in this crazy culture, and, and they were trying to make an impact, and Paul wrote a letter, the book of Ephesians talks about how to have an impact with your family, how to have an impact um, uh, in the city you live, how to have an impact even in the place that you work, all these different areas, and he concludes it by using these items of a soldier's garb and says, I want you to look at this, the, the, these lessons, and so we've been looking at this together. 
Um, we talked about, uh, one, that our enemy is not against flesh and blood. That was the first week. Um, our enemy is not against human beings, okay? Um, so I want you to turn to a human near you and say, I ain't fighting you, okay? Okay. Now turn to another person, say, neighbor number two, you want some, okay? That is, no, that is not a dating invite. Okay, that is not what that's, that's not what that is, but, um, but think about this, is, is our, our, our fight, our battle, our enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not human beings, it's not politicians, it's not outlaws, it's not in-laws, it's not, it's not these things. Our fight is bigger. Our fight is not a culture war, it's a cosmic war. Now, um, it was easy for me to talk about our fight's not a culture war um, in the previous weeks. Today's gonna be a little tougher, okay? Um, but, but let me remind you, our fight is not a culture war. Now, will we be involved in court culture? Can we have passionate conversations about policy? Absolutely. But to have an angst against half of politicians is not godly because our weapon, our, our battle is not flesh and blood. Our battle is something bigger. It's a cosmic battle. We are to fight for people, not with people. And we need to understand that otherwise we get distracted. And God's only given us as a community, let's just talk as a community here, right? God's only given us enough fighting energy to fight the real battles. And if we waste our energy fighting the wrong battles, we'll never have the unity or the energy to fight the battles that matter, to help people who are hurting, and that is our battle. Now, we easily get dodged and distracted into fighting the wrong battles. But the first week we talk about that. And the second week we start talking about the weapons. We said the first weapon is the belt of truth. And we talked about that truth holds everything else together. Um, and we also talked about the 21st century uh, version of that is <laughs> truth holds your pants up, right? Pants on the ground, pants on the ground. <laughs> and, and so so truth holds your pants up, which means without truth, you're going to get exposed eventually. And so we, we've got to have that integrity. Second thing was the breastplate of righteousness, that it's not righteousness. Like rarely do we like, man, I just want righteousness. Um, but, but it's something that God has given us as a gift, and it's not this, this neurotic pursuit of perfection. I will not sin next year even if it kills me. Well, guess what? It'll kill you, okay? <laughs> Trying to, to live that perfect life. It's not a pursuit of perfection. It is a commitment to protection, that I am going to righteousness defined by God's ways, Jesus' ways, not my culture's ways, not my, my preferences' ways, but God's ways. Anything that does not align with Jesus or does not align with the teachings of Jesus in Scripture, I need to align my own life. I am not the king of me. I am not the boss of me. And that righteousness doesn't make me a better person. It makes me less vulnerable. It protects my heart, right? So that was righteousness. Then we uh, talked last week about the, uh, the shoes. Uh, we're fitted with the shoes, with the readiness of the good news of peace. That every day that we would put on the ability to be peaceful because there are rough patches we talked about out there. There are environments that are rough. Sometimes us and a perceived enemy, there's shrapnel and sharp, sharp objects along the way. And so when we put on God's supernatural peace every day, we're able to walk right into the middle of rough situations and be able to be proclaimers and good news uh, abroad casters of peace. And, and, uh, and so what, what we also want to do is we also want to recognize that there's a connection between us and people who don't share our beliefs. And what our job to do as peacemakers is to sweep away the shrapnel that makes the road between us less inviting. And so one of our jobs is to say, okay, who's someone in my life that, that my words, my actions have been shrapnel and I've littered the path between me and them and I've made it less inviting for them to even want to be here? I can't make them come and have a relationship with me. What I can do is I can sweep away the shrapnel. Now, as followers of Jesus, we also realize that there was shrapnel between us and God. That was sin. And it was my sin. It was your sin. And, and our sin made the way between us and God uncrossable. But Jesus put on peace. He was our peace. And he got rid of all the enmity between us and God. And he made a very invitational, attractive path between us. Many of us that are gathered have made that decision to follow him. Some of you have not. And our hope today is that even in our conversation, our time together, would sweep away some of those obstructions and distractions that you might see how inviting and good news the message of Jesus being Lord is for your life, right? 
Um, <clears throat> And, um, and so, so, so we're gonna walk through today a, a new one. And so if you've got the verses uh, that, that are there, it's on our app. It's also, um, uh, if, if you're following along on, uh, online, it should be there for you. It'll be on the screen. Um, starting in verse 10, uh, it says this. Uh, this has been the series. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in God's mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle isn't against flesh and blood. It's not against the rulers or against the authorities against the powers of the dark. It is against the rulers and authorities. It's against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So every day, God lays it out for us. Don't go around being a Christian streaker and not wearing anything. Every day, put on these items. Why? So that we're less vulnerable. And one day, there's gonna be an evil day. Because it says, when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, simply stand. So stand firm then with a belt of truth, buckle around your waist. We talked about that, the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And here's where we're going this week. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And, and, and one of the translations says it this way, and above all else, one of the most important items you can take up is the shield of faith. Why? With which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, um, uh, I don't have a shield with me today, okay? I've got, this is gonna have to do today. Um, it's, so if you got a fourth grader in an art project coming up, let me know, okay? Um, but like I have one, one uh, staff member who I was like, hey, I, I know your kid loves Captain America. Can you bring in the shield? And the shield is like, Let's just say it's not very big, okay? Um, and I mean, it's not big enough for me to wanna use that plate at a buffet. And so I'm like, okay, that really doesn't picture what we're trying to go for um, because the object um, was called a scutum um, and a scutum was a four and a half feet uh, uh, tall shield, two and a half feet wide. So this is as close as we get. So yes, I'm nine feet tall uh, with these dimensions. Um, so imagine this being four and a half feet tall and probably not made of plywood. Um, well, this isn't plywood. Post board. Um, it, it, it is metal or wood, probably wood uh, would be the typical uh, shield in the Roman soldier's army. Some of them would be crafted, uh, some metal and whatnot. Um, four and a half feet tall and, and it would be two and a half feet wide. Basically their whole body can cower behind one of these things. A shield is not an offensive weapon. It is a defensive uh, weapon, right? Now, I'm sure any angry mama could make it an offensive weapon and give you a goose egg on top of your head. Um, but um, a shield is a defensive weapon. It says, above all else, take up your shield, okay? So, because the enemy is gonna be firing all these flaming arrows at you. I don't know if you've ever seen old movies like 300, um, you know, Ben-Hur, whatever old movies, and, and they're, they're going to battle, and you got the enemy up there, and they're thud, okay? And what they would do is they would take these big old uh, shields and they would wrap them with hide from some animal, uh, some type of leather, and then they would just soak them in water. And so these suckers were heavy. And, and so that way they would hear thud, right? And, and it would put out, it would extinguish the flaming arrows. Now, you didn't want to be like, woo, I am Dodge Man, okay? Whoop, whoop, whoop. That's not how you fought. You wanted to be shield boy, okay? You wanted to have a shield. And Paul says, listen, you have an enemy who's firing off some hot missiles coming in, and you better have faith. So let's talk about what faith is and then some application for us. I put on our outline this, that faith is a path, not a potion. Faith isn't something that happens to you as much as it, it's something that happens through you. Faith is not some magical potion that when you commit your life to Jesus, everything's happy and clappy. That, that when you go to get baptized, all of a sudden, uh, now that you live this, this glorious life. Baptism doesn't make your life perfect, it makes your life wet. That's what baptism does. Now it's important, okay? We're gonna be celebrating it here in a couple of weeks. What it is, is a declaration of dependence. It's saying that I trust in Jesus as my Lord. He is the one that I follow from this day forward. I may not be perfect. This isn't like a, a graduation ceremony of the most perfect Christians. It is, it is an initiation of those who are saying, I have made a commitment to Christ on the inside and I want everybody to know about it. It's awesome, but here's where faith comes in. Faith for today's purpose is not what you believe as much as what you do with what you believe. It is how I put into play the things that God's put in my heart. It's awesome that God puts things in your heart. 
But it's vital that you translate that and put it into play. That's faith. Faith is not the knowledge that God loves me. Faith is every day, all those fiery arrows that come in to say that I'm worthless, that that God's ashamed of me, he's disappointed in me, and we sang the song at our campuses earlier, that I've always been loved, I've always been loved, and when I walk that out, it's faith. And when I feel like, man, I just blew it, I just messed up, but God still loves me, it's faith. It is a scandalous, crazy, good news, I gotta tell everyone, everybody about it kind of love and it's the faith that gets in my gut and I cannot put it out it allows me to keep going forward faith is not believing something it's doing something we understand this I remember there was a time uh, in my life where, 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 where faith became real and, 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 and for me, let, let me, let me give this, this deal. It's, it's faith is doing what God asked me to do. So I put it in my outline that way. Faith is doing um, what God asked me to do. Um, it, it is saying, okay, what God put in my heart, I'm gonna act out. When, there was a time in my life when I was single and I really wanted my soulmate. Um, I was in seventh grade and I said, God, would you, would you, I, you know, help me find her, and, and, and God says, I want you to walk in the direction of purity. Well, that sounds lame, <laughs> right? Like, that's not what every seventh grade boy wants to hear. And so you know what that was? It's like, well, I know it. My tendency was to be like, yeah, but how about this? How about I'll figure out my dating life, I'll figure out this, and then when I'm 25 and I figured it out and I found the one I want, then I'll have faith. But faith is like, this isn't fun. I don't like it. But this is what God told me to do. I'm going to do what God told me to do even though it doesn't sound popular with those around me and it goes against what I desire. Faith is doing the thing that God put inside of your heart. There was a time when Leanne and I, um, uh, we had just got married. We didn't have hardly any money, like hardly any money. We just took a job and it was awesome. We were excited because it was a five-figure job every year. And uh, so think about that. Um, so so we, have, we just don't have any money for nothing. We would go to Taco Bell on the weekends for our big expenditures and we would have two items from the Taco Bell menu. We, we weren't a three-item family. We were a two-item family. And so, so we go there. <laughs> I don't know if anyone from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is watching this, but we robbed the church pantry a couple times with some kidney beans. Okay, so we had to do whatever we had to do. We had keys. And, and it was one of those, we, we didn't know. We didn't know, like, sometimes what we we're going to do with food, these kind of things. Um, and so, so there was a time that we were sitting in a service, and there was a missionary and presented these, these needs. And then a pastor came up and says, hey, I want to challenge you. If God's telling you to invest, I want you to invest over the next year. So Leanne and I were sitting there, we're like, we are already like giving, like for us, we were like, we're gonna give 10% of our income, right? And that was what we were gonna give, but we felt like, okay, let's pray about it. And we said to each other, write down a number, right? And we both wrote down this crazy big number for us. And then we showed each other, it was the same number. $25 $25 <laughs> every month. Now, you might be like, I sneeze at $25, okay? Well, then I will like bring pepper and make you, okay? Because I like, rain it down, okay? Because we didn't have $25. And we thought, okay, this, so every month, like the first month we were inspired, we're like, let's do it. God put it in our heart, yes, $25. We wrote that check in faith. The next month, we were like, has it been 12 months yet? That was our commitment. Has it been, no, it's only been one? Okay, cool. Um, and the missionary didn't come and inspire us again. You know what we had to do? By faith, do what God put on our heart, even though we didn't feel like it. Um, as parents, there's been times where you're like, I am just gonna survive this shopping trip and that means I'm going to avoid a meltdown and I will give my kids whatever I need to give them right now so they don't embarrass me publicly. Can I get a witness? But sometimes you're like, by faith, you sit your bumper in that seat. <laughs> by faith, I don't care who's watching us. <laughs> and you do what, because if, 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 if you let your kids be always happy right now, they'll never get happy ever after, right? We understand that, right? So, so we have to understand, okay, I need to get through this and you survive this and by faith. You just, sometimes you do the things you know you, you need to do, you just don't feel like doing them. That's faith. And that's God's gift to us every day. So by definition, and the opposite of faith isn't doubt, it's disobedience. The opposite of faith isn't doubt like, I just wonder if God's there. No, that's actually a different um, dysfunction. It's called being human. (laughs) By, By being human, you're gonna have doubts. 
You know where I get that? Scripture. <laughs> like Jesus when he was on the cross. If we're just spitballing characters in the Bible, let's start with Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, this is a terrible plan. Let's not do this one. So if Jesus was allowed to have doubts, how come you've talked yourself into thinking you can never have them? So one, chill out when you got doubts. Secondly, doubts don't mean they're right and they don't mean you're wrong. What they mean is, I gotta, it's not the opposite of faith. Is the shield is saying, I'm not gonna listen to that, but the shield is not doing what you know to be true. The definition of spiritual maturity is how long does it take you to do what God already put in your heart to do? Side note, <laughs> I don't mean to pick on you, but some of you, that comes to surrendering to Jesus. Some of you know that's your next right step and you've never yet surrendered to Jesus. You never made him the Lord of your life. And I'm just telling you, um, you, you might say that the thing that you're, that's holding you up is doubt. It's like, how can a human fit in a whale? I really don't understand that. In your seven days, is that when the create the, the doubts aren't what hold you back, right? It's the disobedience of doing what God's already told you to do. So save us all some time, right, in our own journeys and just do what God's called us to do is what we're supposed to, that, that's faith, right? So Hebrews 11, one says, faith is the confidence of the things that we hope for and it's the assurance of the things that we don't yet see. Faith is saying this, I'm gonna go forward even though I'm not convinced it's gonna end in the result that blesses me. I'm gonna do the right thing. I'm gonna do the right thing at the right time even when I don't understand how it's gonna work out or know if it will work out. Matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, um, there's, a, there's a whole chapter in the book of Hebrews, it's, we call it the hall of faith. Isn't that cute? Uh, but, but what it talks about is all these people who are, are, are renowned in heaven for their faith and guess what? Um, most of them did. Most of them were martyred for their faith. <laughs> so it didn't necessarily work out for them. So what I'm saying is this, faith isn't like this magic potion that comes in my life. Kingdom kid, favor ain't fair, it's not that. Faith is doing the right thing no matter what it costs me. Faith is having the right attitude no matter what I feel, right? Faith is, 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 is saying I am surrendered to, to a different plan. So with that, here's a couple of practical applications. One, faith provides a covering of protection. When I have faith in my life, and what I mean is when I do the right thing, even when I don't want to, it covers me. Okay? Faith is this, this ability that when all the flaming arrows are flinging, I can, and again, if you think four and a half feet of this thing, um, is I can get my whole body behind it. And, and here's what we would see is the same, uh, the, the, the Roman soldiers, um, they would go in in a big old huddle, and maybe you've seen the movies, and when the enemy's attacking, they're firing their arrows in the air, and it's all gonna land, you know. Um, what they'll do is the people in the middle of their huddle, they'll put, they'll put the shields above them, like a little roof, and everyone on the outlier will put it sideways, and so you got this dome. And we get the formation that it's called is the same word translated tortoise, okay? It's the shell, it's impenetrable, when you've got a bunch of people. So um, is it possible to be a follower of Jesus and not hang out with anyone else as a follower of Jesus? Absolutely. Does it make you a bad person if you're not? No. But you know one of the benefits of being able to connect with others is to be able to form an impenetrable wall. It doesn't mean bad things aren't gonna happen to you, but it means your faith will be intact. And then no matter what happens, no matter what hell you find yourself in the middle of, you know that there's this confidence and there's a connection and there's this, this sense of community that you find together. And, and, and there's going to be times in the middle of the battle, that's all we have to hold on to, that I'm not alone. You got my back. I got your back. Let's hang in here, right? And, uh, and so that's why I think every, every family needs community. Every family needs people. Every marriage needs people. Every, every uh, business person needs community. Every, every, every community leader needs community. We need uh, this kind of protection. So it provides this, this covering of protection, but it also provides a confidence in direction. When I've got my shield, I can keep pushing forward. Even though the battle is heavy, I'm like the shield. I can keep pushing forward. I can go in the right direction no matter the opposition. Now, I don't do it in arrogance, okay? I do it in confidence. There's a difference between confident, I'm coming forward, I ain't stopping, I'm not stopping, I'm coming forward, no one's gonna warn me I'm at the edge. Okay, okay, come on now, come on, I almost fell off. Okay, um, so there's, there's a difference between confidence and cockiness. Ha, 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 ha. Because when I'm cocky, I'm vulnerable. 
You don't go peacocking as a Roman soldier. Woo! Stop me now, right? You're going to become a dartboard. So what you need to be is lose the cocky and just keep going forward. Like, oh, all you hear is thud, thud, thud. You're like, oh, just tuck your wings, okay? Keep going forward. And, and some of you, I don't know if you think this looks like faith, and some of you think this is faith. No, this is arrogance. And you know what happens when you get cocky? You have a funeral, okay? And it's yours. Because you're dead if you think you can do it in your own strength. And how many of you have ever left the house and had to turn around and go get it? You're like, oh, I can't go the day without it. Maybe it's toothpaste, right? <laughs> Maybe it's your iPhone. Like, what in the world would I do for the next two hours without my iPhone, right? And we turn around. Like, our faith every day. Every day I pick up this up and be like, God, I, I got to go forward in confidence. God, I got to live out the things that I heard from you. That's why we always talk about next steps around here. Next steps are, what do I do now that I heard something? The moment I can hear a message or read scripture and not have a next step, I'm either not paying attention or it's arrogance. Every single time I need to say, God, I'm a different person than the last time that I read this. I'm a different person than the last time I heard this. God, what is my next best step for you? Now let me apply it, and it's called faith. That's not belief, it's not information, it's application. So, last couple of things here is that sometimes faith looks like a powerful hero. And you, you hear stories of people who conquered awesome things in his faith. They're the MVP of the Super Bowl. And they want to thank, first and foremost, my God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. And you're like, wow, that's so awesome that God made them throw a football like that. I can't believe he doesn't like the other team, but that's cool, okay? Um, but we're like, you know, someone wins the Grammy. Oh, I want to thank my God and Father, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's awesome. God gave them the ability to write the song. Sometimes it's that person who's a missionary in a land far, far away that changed nations for the kingdom, and you're like, that's a hero of faith. Sometimes it's like Billy Graham, who just as I am, and everyone turns their life to Christ, and you're like, oh, my word, a hero of faith. And that's correct. They're heroes of faith, right? But sometimes faith doesn't look like a confident warrior. Sometimes faith looks like a stubborn survivor. It's someone who's just shielded down. And all they hear is thud, thud, thud. It's a cancer report. It's a phone call from the kids. It's a demotion, not the promotion. And they're like, when will this stop? But they won't let down the shield. And some of you have been under attack for a long time. And you're like, I don't know if this is working. Oh, it's working. I want you to know God sees you. God knows you. And don't let down your shield. The promise is not that you would have a golden life. The promise is that you'd be guarded. You'd be protected. I wish the calls didn't come. I wish the medical reports weren't like that. But you're not alone. The great is your reward. I've been able to be at many funerals of people who aren't famous. And I walked away saying, they have shaken eternity with the way they lived the way they loved their kids, the way they rebounded from addiction, the way that they served their community. Maybe you don't have the faith to be on the front page of a newspaper. I'm just kidding. We don't have newspapers anymore, do we? On the top of a web page. But maybe you have the faith of a struggling survivor. And you go, girl. <laughs> Keep going, dude. Hang in there. <laughs> you got this. Don't give up. I want us to have faith. Um, and now I want to talk about it. a tension point. And, and I realize it. Um, today I want to talk about the Supreme Court for a, a couple moments. And I really want you to lean in. Um, 
And I, and I also realize that there's a good chance you stop carrying my picture as your home screen uh, at the end of this. And I, I think I'll be fine. I, I'll talk to my therapist about it afterwards, but we'll, we'll be all right. Um, last week, we talked about being peacemakers. As a church, what if we lived in such a way where we wrapped our feet with a supernatural peace that if there were ever rough areas, we can go into them and we can make them more attractive. And guess what God blessed us with this week? Opportunity for homework. I don't know if you realize that the Supreme Court um, had a very interesting um, uh, decision on Roe v. Wade this last week. And if you didn't know that, congratulations on your ability to really tune things out and have some days off. I love that and you should teach a seminar, okay? Um, and if you're just learning this, please don't go online until we're done, okay? So um, I don't know if you also realized that there's probably more passion to the topic of abortion than almost any other topic. Um, and I also don't know if you've realized that there are probably people you love who in comprehensibly don't think just like you, which is crazy because I think you've got it dialed, okay? I think you've got it figured out and anyone who doesn't agree with you is, has a learning curve ahead of them, okay? But you might be fully aware that you're surrounded with people who even share your last name who don't all agree with you. How disappointing is that? Have you also noticed that you share a church with people who don't agree with you? And that might be surprising to some of you. It's true, okay? <laughs> so, what I wanna do, I wanna share this. How as a church do we respond? How does a follower of Jesus respond when you have probably scripture that lends confidence to your perspective on either end, which might be surprising to even know. Even if the way that you look at the situation is the correct way, I think with curiosity to lean in and say, there are people who disagree with you who also are surrendered wholly to Jesus Christ. And again, I'm not even talked about what position you're on. Or I'm, I'm just saying just to have an awareness and understanding or a curiosity of that would help me dial down the vitriol. Uh, as a follower of Jesus, uh, sometimes I say as a pastor, I'm like, eh, pastor, pastor is overrated. But let me tell you, as a follower of Jesus, I really, really um, lean towards life in any situation possible. I do, because I believe it's image of God in life, and I also don't believe that that ends at birth. I believe in every stage of life, there should be compassion, um, there should be assistance, there should be value and dignity, and it's so, here's what I also believe, it's more complicated than I used to think it was. So maybe for you, that's your next step, just to understand that this whole topic's more complicated. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be passionate, but I think you should be more than passionate, you should be compassionate. <laughs> that you should say, okay, God, if I believe in people expressing and experiencing the life that comes from you, what must I do in this situation, right? How can I help that? And, and that's not gonna keep you on one party line at all times. It's not as simple as that. Every situation, you need to be able to separate what might be the norm and just say, God, how do we express your love and your life in this situation? So right now, there are a lot of people who would vote one way who are shouting victory, and, and then there are people who feel another way who are shouting lament, and a lot of times that is shrapnel on both sides saying, how can you see it differently? 
And as North Point, we are not unified based on how we vote. We're not, we're not, which was surprising to some people in the last several years. They're like, oh, people used to say this. <laughs> I love North Point because it comes to everybody from all walks of life show up to North Point. I love it that we don't all believe the same thing until they realize they don't vote the same way. And they're like, oh, wait a second. I would rather go to a church where I know everyone votes the same way. And I get it. And good news is you live in a great town. I'm sure you can find one. Okay, but... <laughs> Okay, but, okay, with this, <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay, so here we go. Here, that's not what unifies us. I got people I deeply care for who I know deeply are surrendered to Jesus Christ on both sides of this situation. So I got great curiosity. I got great compassion. But here's what binds North Point together is a mission and a vision to demonstrate the love of Jesus to be a safe place for anybody to show up and have a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. And if they don't show up here to have that, it is our, not preference, our mandate to go outside these walls and to express the life-giving, loving nature and reflection of Jesus Christ in every area of our community and beyond. That's what makes North Point, North Point. We have, and no matter what side of the way you see this, whether, if, if you feel like, man, this is the victory that I've been praying for, I'm like, this, this doesn't change anything about the need for compassion and any arrogance that we lead with will be shrapnel that makes you a lot less likely to be able to even partner with people who need compassion. And if you are on the side of saying, this is the worst thing ever, more people are gonna be more vulnerable than ever before, potentially there will be more vulnerable people than ever before, then either way we would all agree on this, we have to continue. North Point's always been about assisting those who are vulnerable, coming alongside of them, serving in any way we can. We've always been that way from day one. We always will be, and this season must not be any different. We have some great partner organizations that we are proud to stand behind that help us assist people in their darkest, most confusing, hurting, alone days. Organizations like Convoy of Hope, one of my favorite organizations, on planet Earth who make living in Springfield so much more attractive. And, and to be able to say, you guys come along those who, who feel overwhelmed, underserved, and, and they've always done that, we've always supported it, and we will continue to do so. Uh, organizations like the Dream Center who come alongside and say, we want to help those who are overwhelmed and underserved. We will do whatever it takes. We will continue to do so. Organizations like Pregnancy Care Center, which are not trying to talk anybody into any political decision, what they're trying to do is provide sources of help uh, for those who are unprepared, unplanned, um, undersupported, unknown needs, and to say, what can we give you? Diapers, training, classes, what can we do to serve you? Uh, organizations like foster agencies, um, that, that provide homes for people who, for whatever reason, find themselves vulnerable and discarded. We've always partnered with, it, with uh, organizations like them, and we will do so more than ever. And here's what we're gonna do this week. It's not lost to me we're building a new campus. It's not lost to me we have a big organization. It's not lost to me there's a lot of things that, that we, 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 we invest in. But this weekend, every penny that comes in today, whether online, text to give, or in the bucket, and just a second, every penny will be going out to one of those partner organizations. We are not gonna take one penny today. We're not gonna let it go to any other um, uh, investment or any other uh, bill or anything. Every penny you give today, whether it's online or whether it's in one of our services, we will uh, distribute all of that this next week to these partner organizations because we believe in what they're doing. We believe in a crazy world of chaos and culture and uh, loudness and division that we would say, let's at least all come together and reflect the love of Jesus in practical ways. Let our faith not be what we say we profess or believe, but what we do. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna invite our ushers to come forward to each of our campuses. As they do that, um, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond knowing that every penny that you give today is going to go towards uh, these organizations. Um, I want you to give with even more passion than you post. And for some of you, that's going to be quite a giving, okay? Because you've been doing some quite some postings, and that's all right, okay? 
how right now, ask God. God, what can I do today to say, faith, I'm gonna do something with what I believe. It's not about a policy, it's about a reflection of the love of Jesus. Now, will we be engaging in policies? Absolutely, you bet, okay? Let's have robust conversations that are led with curiosity, not arrogance, and not anger, but as we do this together, what kind of collective movement can we be that whatever situation we find ourselves, we will partner with the, those who feel forgotten, who feel discarded, who feel overwhelmed, and in doing so, may God let our gifts, our service, our deeds reflect the love of Jesus. And if we ever have the opportunity, whether it's outside these walls or inside these walls, may they find a safe place for people to find Jesus, to follow Jesus, to receive the scandalous love and to reflect it that way. So I wanna encourage you, uh, uh, give generously if you're at a spot where you're able to today and know as a church, let's do something. We've probably all said something, but let's do something today and let's be that sweet aroma uh, as, as we let this gift uh, impact others. So let me pray over this. So Father, first I pray for our hearts. We get out of the lines. God, I pray that we would reflect the love of Jesus. Let our feet be fitted with a readiness that comes from the good news of peace. Let us be, let us be good news spreaders. And God, I pray for our gift today. Let us be encouragement to organizations who are gonna need the support more than they ever have. And let us be positioned in such a way where there's a pathway that's attractive, not only between us and, and others, but us and uh, but them and you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.